I hope you are in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. <clears throat> if not, please turn there. If you read with our elder, you should have noticed a repetitive phraseology that showed itself over and over and over and over again. I hope you saw it. If not, I want you to write down the word rest. I want you to write down the word rest. Our elder read Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 and the word rest was repeated nine times. Nine times. Verse 1, rest. Verse 3, rest, rest. Verse 4, rest. Verse 5, rest. Verse 8, rest. Verse 9, rest. Verse 10, rest. Verse 11, rest. What's the focus, saints? Rest. Rest. You and I live in the midst of a world that has no rest. Is that true? You and I today in 2024 now, get used to saying that, live in a very topsy-turvy world that is tumultuous and it is filled with chaos and confusion and restlessness. And people are losing their minds today, are they not? And people are turning to medication very, very heavily to seek to find peace that they will not find in a peel, but a, a peace that they can only find in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the thing that I want you to know. The true believer, Psalm 62, verse 6, if we can get that up, it's not on your outline. Psalm 62, verse 6, the believer has a secret that the rest of the world doesn't have. We have an anchor in our soul that keeps us in a very peaceful state because no matter what happens in our world and its topsy-turvy events and things are falling apart and people are falling apart around us and you and I are always on the verge of an existential threat coming and destroying our existence every day and yet you and I who are believers in Jesus Christ can sleep at night because we know that there is one who's on the throne controlling all these things, don't we? Right, and so we can have rest in that reality. The true believer has not only seen these words rest on the <clears throat> pages of Scripture, but by the Holy Ghost is right now experimentally uh, uh, having this peace residing in their heart because they know the true and the living God. He's dwelling in them by His Spirit, and He's spoken peace to their souls, telling them, Children, I've got this under control. I'm presently working all things after the counsel of my own will, as bad as it is and as bad as it's going to get. I'm still on the throne and I'm still working all things out for your good and my glory. Look at Psalm 62, verse 6. And I'm thinking about what Paul said in Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his what? Purpose purpose. Look at this. Psalm 62 verse 6. David says, he only is my rock. There's only one rock and his name is Jesus. He only is my rock and my what? Write it down. Salvation is a person. Salvation is personified in Jesus Christ. Salvation is not something you do. It's a person that you know. And it's a person that you trust in. They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Isn't that what the Bible says? Right. This is why we have peace. Look, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my what? Ooh, we have a shield. We have a buckler. We have a defense to protect us from all forms of evil. He only is my defense. And then I shall not what? I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. Isn't that good? The true believer will not be moved because we're, we're housed on a rock. We're on a firm foundation that can never be moved. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's what the master said, right? One more verse. Uh, Isaiah 26 verse 3 is another beautiful verse. And it really describes, listen, the secret to the believer's peace. <clears throat> if you are here today and you don't have peace, uh, Isaiah 60, uh, 26 verse 3 is for you. 
If you're here today and you're troubled and you're filled with fears and phobias and anxieties, I want you to see Isaiah 26. But remember, you also have another comfort in Scripture that says, listen, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. If you're filled with anxiety and fear and worry, it's because you have you fail to cast. You fail to cast. All believers are called to cast. Take your fears and phobias and cast them on Jesus Christ. Look what it says here. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind. How do I have perfect peace? By my mind staying on him. Where is your mind? Where is your mind? Don't our minds wander and drift every day? Here's how you can tether your mind. Get your mind on the things of God. Seek those things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Colossians 3. Right. Whose mind is stayed on thee because he what? Trusts in thee. But you know how this really can be read? You might not have ever noticed this before. Many of you know this verse. Raise your hand if you know this verse. Some of you guys know this verse by heart. Let me share this with you. This verse can be read like this. You will keep him in peace, peace. You will keep him in peace, peace. It's technically you will keep him in shalom, shalom. Those two words are the same Hebrew word. Double peace, double peace, peace with God and peace in your heart, peace vertically and peace internally, which you and I have in Jesus Christ. In me, you shall have peace in the world. You shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. Isn't that what our master says? That's right. And it's double peace because we're children of God. And because we're firstborn sons in Jesus Christ, we get the double portion. Do you see that there? That's right. Christ has already made peace. He's already made peace with us. And so and, and what I'm getting ready to say might sound like a paradox. What I'm getting ready to say, I'm saying all these things about peace and then I'm getting ready to talk about fear. <laughs> I'm getting ready to talk about fear. Go to Hebrews chapter four. And in Hebrews chapter four, remember, Paul is writing this about six years before the destruction of Jerusalem. This is about 64 A.D., five, six years before Jerusalem is pummeled and destroyed. And Paul is writing to Hebrew Christians who've been converted from Judaism to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And they are believers in Jesus Christ. But Paul knows that they're only on their way. They have not arrived yet. They have not crossed Jordan. And so they need to do what Paul did to keep the faith. To finish the course, to fight the good fight of faith until they end up ultimately laying hold on eternal life. Right. We need to do the same thing. Listen, don't be presumptuous. You're not in glory yet. Don't be presumptuous. You're not in glory yet. We're on our way, aren't we? We're there in our forerunner. Wait till you get to Hebrews six. We have an anchor that I mentioned earlier that's entered into the veil, our forerunner. But you and I personally are not there yet. We're on our way. Right. So look at verse one. And Paul is being the good parent of Christian children. He's being the good pastor and apostle. And he says to the Jewish Christians, and he's saying to you and I here at Way of Grace, he's saying, let us therefore what? Fear. But nine times he mentions rest in Hebrews chapter four. And yet he talks about fear here. I want to talk about the exhortation to fear. I want to exhort you today to fear. Please listen to me. I want to exhort you today to fear. And I need to qualify that. Okay. Let us therefore what? Fear. Fear what, Paul? Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Jump to verse 11. <clears throat> he says it here too. Uh, he says, let us labor. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. That means the believer is responsible to labor, to agonize. To endure, to fight, to press on until they make it to glory. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. That means that there's a sense in which we have not entered into it yet. Lest any man, what? Fall after the same example of unbelief. And to the Jewish, the Jews he's writing here to, he's talking about the, the example of infamy. The infamous example of the predecessors, those Jews that went before them that perished in the wilderness. That's our historical context. Those Jews that perished in the wilderness because of what? Unbelief. That's what we've been talking about. So point one on your outline. Let's go to work here. Point one on your outline. He says here, point one says a healthy and holy phobia 
is necessary to prevent falling short of the promise. Now, all of us struggle with different types of phobias. Some of us have fear of speaking. Some of us have a fear of heights. Some of us have uh, uh, fears of social interactions. I can go on and on with the list of fears. And, and, and some of those fears um, might not necessarily be good and healthy fears. Um, uh, we know that there's a such thing as unhealthy fears. God has not given us the spirit of fear, right? So there are some fears that love casts out. Perfect love casts out what? Fear. But the kind of fear I'm getting ready to talk to you right now, perfect love is not designed to cast that out. It's a gift from God. The kind of fear I'm going to talk about now is a fear from God. I want, you to, I want you to see this in the illustration of two walls. If you can write two walls or picture two walls in your head. The preventative measure that God uses to keep Christians from falling are two walls. Let me tell you what those two walls are. Wall number one. And you need two walls to keep you in. God always fences his people in. When God loves someone and, he, and something is valuable and precious to him, he puts a fence around them. Hence, hence. He puts a fence on their border. He puts a fence around the border so that foreign invaders cannot come in and do harm. Hint, hint. Christ is our fence. Christ is our wall, our shield and our buckler. Didn't we just sing that? Hint, hint. Um, here are the two walls. Wall number one, love, love, love. Love is a good preventative, isn't it? Right. We are constrained. Paul says we are constrained and compelled by the what? The love of Christ to do what we're doing. Right. And then the other wall that God puts up is the wall of fear. The wall of fear. And when you're a newer Christian, an immature Christian, you are more, if we're honest, you tend to be more compelled by fear. You tend to be more compelled by fear. In fact, uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the fear that caused you to flee from the wrath of God to come to Jesus Christ, right? That should be if you've heard the gospel of right. It's John the Baptist that talked about fleeing from the wrath of God. So fear on one hand is designed to, uh, let me go back. Love uh, should be the, the compelling force that drives the believer. But fear is designed by God to keep you and I from being presumptuous. Because we still have a fallen nature and we tend to take God for granted, don't we? And his gospel and his grace for granted. And his people and his church and his means of grace, we tend to take those things for granted, don't we? Tell the truth. Right. So on one hand, God puts up one wall called fear to keep us from presumption. Keep us from presumption. But he also works in us, shedding abroad in us the love of God, which is an incredible fuel to keep you going. Not even death can quench love. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, 5, and 6. Very important. All right. So when the love of God doesn't kick in, sometimes you're tempted to sin. And sometimes the love of God don't kick in. You just go ahead and commit that sin, right? Love doesn't work any ill toward its neighbor. So every time we sin, there's an element of love missing from our heart when we sin. Because we're transgressing against God. Can y'all see that? But what God does is he uses two walls. When the love of God doesn't kick in to stop us, it's the fear of God that will kick in to stop us. And so you need both walls because God is a God of balance and we need to stay in the straight way. And we need two uh, uh, lanes and two barriers and two walls to keep us straight. It's very important. We need both of those. We need both of those working side by side. You need love and you need fear. Don't be a fear. Don't be afraid of that. It's a healthy fear that God uses to keep us. So point number one, a healthy and holy phobia is necessary to prevent falling short of the promise. What kind of fear am I talking about right now? I want you to write down a healthy and jealous fear. You should be jealous for your own soul. You should be jealous for the protecting and the preserving and the ultimate salvation of your soul. That's a good thing for you to be jealous of. If you're jealous of something, you're zealous to protect it. Don't fall a, a prey to the idea that all jealousy is bad. God is a jealous God and his jealousy is righteous and pure and good. And you should be jealous for that which you love. Husbands, you should have a holy jealousy for the welfare of your wife. And wives, you should have a holy jealousy for the love of your husband. And parents, you should have a holy jealousy for your children. People of God, we should be jealous for the glory of God and for the gospel. Those are things we should be jealous for. Okay, so we should have a healthy and jealous fear for our soul. Now, the word fear here, look at verse one. 
See the word fear here in our text is phobithomene, the Greek term phobithomene, and that prefix there, phobia, where we get the word phobia. Phobia, which means to fear. The term fear here means to put to flight or to terrify. To terrify, to be frightened or to be filled with dread. So what is he saying here? You and I should be terrified or filled with dread at, the, at even the very thought of departing from Jesus Christ. We should be terrified at the implications. Because as Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What are the implications if you and I depart from the Lord of glory, the only one that can save us? Jesus Christ is life, right? If you depart from life, what is the only alternative? Death. So therefore, we're good and healthy to have a holy phobia that makes us cling to Jesus Christ with all of our might. Are you clinging to Jesus Christ with all of your might? Because if you're not, you will, your grip will loosen and you will fall away. Yes, we, uh, uh, let me say this as you're turning to Philippians chapter 2. I want you to sit in another passage. Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> we, we, we revel in the reality that Jesus keeps us. You, should, you all should be turning to Philippians chapter 2. We revel in the reality that Jesus has his grace grips on us and will never let us go. But if he's really got his grip in you... It should cause you to put your grips in him. A person that does not have their grips in Jesus may be evidencing that Jesus never had his grips in them. That's a frightening reality, but it's true for many people. As they go on in their journey with Jesus Christ, their grip gets loose. They begin to operate in presumption and you fall right into the devil's hand. The devil wants you to operate in presumption and, and um, indolence and carelessness. And what he wants to do is remove that sobering fear from your heart. Like he said to Eve, no, 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 you shall not surely die. Go on ahead and eat from the tree. You guys in Philippians chapter 2, watch, Paul says the same thing here. Uh, uh, from verse 4 all the way down to verse 11, he's talking about the exaltation of Jesus Christ by virtue of his uh, successful atoning work. He's resurrected to the right hand of God with all power in heaven and earth in his hands because he died at Calvary's tree to atone for our sins. That's all of our hope and all of our trust is in that finished work. We're only saved because of the blood. We're not saved because of anything we did, right? Now, after that, I'll, I'll start at verse 11. It says, and here's the end result, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, that means he's God. To the glory of God the Father, right? <clears throat> now, verse 12 is what I want you to see. Wherefore, as a result of these things, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my what? I want you to continue in your obedience. My, by the way, that's one of the evidence that you've been saved is obedience. If you love me, what? If you love Jesus, you engage in what's called obediential love. If you love Jesus, you will engage in what's called obediential love. True love obeys. True love obeys. So he says here, <clears throat> uh, but... Now, much more in my absence, watch this, saints, work out your own salvation with what? It is. And what? So we have even another inspired writer that's saying it here. Do it with fear and trembling. When he says work out your salvation, he's not saying work for your salvation. None of your translations say work for your salvation, do they? Right. So we know he's not saying you earn salvation by your works and by your deeds. That's not what he's saying. What you want to write down two things. Number one, when he says work out, he means uh, two things. Number one, evidence show and manifest that you truly have experienced salvation. Evidence and work out and manifest that salvation. Listen, that God has already worked in you. Work out what God has already worked in you. Did you get it? Work out what God has already worked in you. So it would look something like this. Uh, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Don't we rejoice in that Bible verse? You and I have a purpose. You and I have a purpose in this world is to shine the light of Jesus, that Jesus would be glorified. God would be magnified and sinners would be saved. Sinners would be saved. That's our desire and our hope. <clears throat> so we want to work it out. You and I are called to be lights in this world, are we not? 
Let me prove it to you. Go down a couple verses. Okay. Verse, at first, I need you to see verse 13. Verse 12, he says, work out your own salvation. And verse 13, he's, t- he's telling us, you're not doing this on your own. Look, for it's God which works where? In you. Verse 12, work out. Verse 13, work in. You're working out, verse 12, because God has already worked in you. It's a salvation that's already been accomplished by Jesus Christ, verse 13. Now, evidence, you have it, verse 12. Did everybody get that? Right. We're not working for salvation. Christ already accomplished that for us. Then he says, for it's God who works in you, both to what and to what? Will and to do. That means if you're willing to come to Christ, it's God because God made you willing. It's because God made you willing. Very important that we know that. You only will for God because he first worked in you to will. Right. No such thing as free will. Your will is against God before salvation and God lovingly, graciously changes your will. He makes us willing in the day of his power. Psalms 110 verse 3, right? All right, let's keep going. Verse 13, it's God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Watch, I'm, I'm going to show you how what, what Paul is talking about includes the idea of you shining forth light and evidencing that salvation that he's worked in us. Verse 14, do all things without murmuring. And disputings, right? That doesn't manifest God when we have a disposition to always whine and cry and complain, right? We don't, do, we don't ever do that, do we? No, we don't ever do that. <laughs> right, not at all. Listen, when you do that, you're not being like Christ. When you do that, what you're saying, in effect, to the whole watching world, ready? Is God, you're not good. God, you're not good. When you murmur and complain and whine and cry, whine and cry like a lot of Christians do, what you're saying is, God, you're not really good. And then you and I would be giving a false representation to the world that God is not good when he is good. Does that make sense? So we don't want to do that. Verse 15, here it is. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, that you might appear or manifest to be the sons of God, Without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you, what is what? Shine as lights in the world. Shining as lights in the world and manifesting that we're sons of God is evidencing that we truly have salvation. Does that make sense? Let me say something else. I think it's even more important. Go back to verse 12. When he says work out salvation now, here's where our responsibility kicks in. When he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he means, listen, that you and I, to the utmost of our ability, are to strenuously and wholeheartedly engage in those things that on our part are necessary for salvation. This is so important. I'm going to say it again. It means that you and I are called to uh, strenuously and earnestly engage and endeavor to engage in those things that on our part are necessary for our final salvation. Did everybody get that? In other words, you and I are to be diligently engaging in the five means of grace. If you're serious about making it to heaven, you will engage in the five means of grace. If you're not, you will blow off the five means of grace and you will not make it to glory because it's only by his grace. Does that make sense? Do we all know the five means of grace here? Way of grace. We should know the five means of grace. The five means of grace that believers are to earnestly contend in, which amount to working out their salvation with fear. That's what Paul is talking about. Fear, fear, fear is designed to cause you to flee from the wrath of God. Fear is designed to make you hold on to Christ even tighter so you don't depart from him. Fear is designed to make you strive to enter in at the straight gate because there'll be many that will seek to enter, enter in and shall not be able to right. Right. The five means of grace. Number one, reading God's word. If you're serious about going to heaven, you will regularly read God's word. If you're not, you won't. Just as simple as that. Number two, the second means of grace. And these are not in any particular order. If you're serious about making it to heaven, you will be serious about getting yourself under the regular, consistent preaching of the gospel. Preaching of the gospel. You're only saved through preaching. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, you are presently being saved through the preaching. So if you're serious about salvation, you will not circumvent that process. 
You will be a regular, consistent attendee wherever the gospel is being preached, the true gospel. Number uh, three will be meditating on that word, chewing the cud, as we learned in Deuteronomy 14 and Leviticus, Leviticus 11. Chewing the cud, meditating on the word during the week, chewing on it, chewing on it. Number four, prayer. You ain't making it to glory without prayer. I guarantee you that. You will not make it to glory without prayer. Personal prayer, private prayer, public prayer. Personal prayer, public prayer, private prayer. All of those. Jesus did all of those in the scriptures. I can easily take you there and show you. Right. And then the last one, number five, is fellowship of the saints. Fellowship of the saints. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. Uh, of his friend. It's very important. <clears throat> you will engage in those things here. Now, let me say this about fear. Can I get up Psalms 111 verse 10? Your outline should say 111 verse 10. Sorry. Uh, Psalms 111 verse 10. Because Paul says, do this with fear and trembling, fear and dread at the thought of coming short, fear and dread at the thought of coming short. Go back to our home text, please. And, and we'll keep it moving to our next point. But I just want you to see this, please. Hebrews 4. Go back to our home text. The scriptures will teach you and I in the Old and New Testament the importance of fear. Uh, the fear of God is, is, it has been lost today in, in, in church. Because we don't preach the whole counsel of God. We preach a weak, wamby, sissy, sissify, God, not here at Way of Grace. But uh, most presentations of the gospel of God are wrathless. When's the last time you turned on the radio and heard a preacher talking about the wrath of God? No wonder why people don't fear God. And the holy wrath of God is a part of his character. He must punish sin. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Isn't that what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10? And it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding, Solomon says. Watch what it says here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It tells us in another place that it's the fear of the Lord to depart from sin and evil. The fear of God is good. Fear of man is not good. The, the more you fear man, the less you'll fear God. The more you fear God, the less you'll fear man. Did y'all get that? That's important. So Lord, help us, right? Because we struggle. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know what I love about that? Because it's designed to drive us to wisdom personified, which is who? Jesus Christ. So fear, therefore, is good, isn't it? This kind of fear. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. The fear of the Lord is to drive you to seek to do his commandments. Now, again, we're not talking about a Slavic fear. This is a reverential fear. This is a loving fear, a, a filial fear that a child has for his parents. He fears disrespecting them. He fears dishonoring them. Is that present in your heart? Is that present in your heart? If not, ask God to put that in you. Ask God to put that in you. Lord, increase our fear for you. So we hate even the idea of sinning against you. Help us. So a good understanding have all they that do his commandments and his praise endures forever. And I love this, that do his commandments. The ultimate commandment is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you shall be saved. If you didn't know that, that's the ultimate commandment. I have more verses here, but we'll, we'll go ahead and go back to Hebrews four. And we know our Lord also says, uh, fear not he that can kill the body. And after that, he can do nothing else. But I'll tell you who you should fear. Fear him that can destroy bo both body and soul in hell. Isn't that what Jesus said? Luke chapter 12, verse four and five. Luke chapter 12, verse four and five. All right. So I see what the, what the Hebrew writer is getting at. Verse one, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short, short of it. What does left us mean there? Y'all see that there? The, the word um, us is not in the original. Okay? Really, it's let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of entering into his rest. So this is what that word left there means. Left is referring to the promise that... <laughs> was number one left in scripture. We have it recorded in the historical scripture account of the promise that God made to his people in the Old Testament, but it's also left for you and I today to receive it by faith. It's left today in the gospel. This is why he keeps saying today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, today, right? Today, if you hear his voice. Listen, the promise is left for you too. 
The promise can be yours by faith if you receive it by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Isn't that good? Today is still the day of salvation. It's left for you and I to hear it and, and apprehend it and receive it in the gospel. That's what he's talking about there. And then the same danger lies for us, too, to come short of entering into his rest. And he says, any of you should seem to come short of it. Let's go to point number two, please. Point number two, what is the rest here he's talking about? Point two, the heavenly rest that God ushers believers into, but solemnly bars non-believers from. The heavenly rest that God ushers true believers into, but bars non-believers from. That's what I want you to see in the text. So you can write this down. Verse one, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us. He's talking to the Christian church then and to us now. A promise being left of entering into his what? Rest. What kind of rest are you and I called to enter into today? I want you to write it down. The rest in verse one is ultimately talking about heavenly rest in Christ. Heavenly rest in Christ. I'm going to say this now. I'm going to talk to you today about three different types of rest that are mentioned in the scripture. This is our text. Our text in verse 1 through 11 describes three different types of rest. I want all of us to get it. Okay? Three different types of rest. Uh, but the rest in verse 1 is talking about the heavenly rest that is awaiting true believers. Now, he says it again in verse 3. Please look at verse 3. He says, for we which have believed, that's believers, right? We which have believed do enter into what? rest as he said as i have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest or if you have a newer translation it'll say they shall not enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world we're going to talk about what that means here in a minute but what i want you to see here is verse three verse three we we which have believed do enter in enter in it's in the present verb tense what it, it can be said like this we who believe are presently entering into his rest we are presently entering into his rest. So two things I want you to get. If I'm entering into it present tense right now in 2024, that implies two things for you and I who are believers. Number one, that there is a sense in which right now we get some taste of that rest even now. We get some taste of that rest even now. We already saw a couple of verses at the beginning that, that God affords perfect peace to all those whose minds are stayed on him, right? Don't believers have the peace of the Holy Ghost dwelling in them? Right. So we, we get a, a, a little foretaste of it now to cause us to eagerly look forward to the everlasting rest that's laid up for us when we get to heaven. We're entering into it, which means we're not fully there yet. So we don't operate in what's called over-realized eschatology. We, we want to stay away from over-realized eschatology. Over-realized eschatology is you and I operating as if we're already in heaven, as if we're already perfect, as if we, as if we have totally been uh, uh, removed from the realm of having uh, sin natures, and now we're perfect in every aspect. And so now we have to kind of look at each other as if we're strange if we operate in any area of our life in an imperfect fashion. Right. You're not going to experience that kind of uh, perfection in your body till you get to heaven to operate as if we have that now. Well, because I'm a true believer, I, I shouldn't get sick. And because I'm a true believer, uh, 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 I should not have health issues because I'm a true believer. I should never have problems on my job or because I'm a true believer. I should not, never have issues with my family. Who told you that? Who told you that? Or if you're not, if you're having those troubles, the word of faith kind of prosperity gospel would say, well, because your faith is too weak or your faith is too strong or there's an issue uh, with your faith. And so because you're not perfectly obeying the commandments of God, then you're not experiencing the perfection that's already yours in this life. That's, that's not the true gospel. We're entering into it. We're not perfect yet. We're whips, works in process, aren't we? Right. So, so embrace that in process part because that's your sanctification. God is working on you, changing you, molding you, growing you, maturing you, refining you. All those things, taking us through the fire. When he's done, we'll come through. We'll be like pure gold, right? That's why we have all the issues and struggles we have in this life because God's working on us. He's working on us. All right. So I'm, I'm hoping you guys are seeing that. So we're talking about rest. Let me just say it. Put, put up Matthew eleven twenty eight, so I can just get to it. We're going to keep moving. I want to talk about the concept of rest here, okay? So why he's putting that verse up, verse 3 again, we which have believed do enter into what? Rest. So believers 
in part. Believers, in part, experience rest right now. But the full culmination of it will be when we get to heaven. So, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Look, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, laboring under the weight of your sins, laboring under the crushing weight of your sins and transgressions, crushing down on your conscience, and the weight of trying to keep commandments that you can never keep. But Christ kept them all for you. So he says, come to me, Christian. Let me take that big old backpack off of your back and give you peace and rest in your soul. I will bear those transgressions in your place and put them away by my death at the cross. That's the peace I'm talking about. Peace of conscience, peace and soul, peace of the reality to know that I am no longer an object of the wrath of God. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, some of you have experienced that. Some of you have not experienced that. Some of you may not have experienced that. Listen, but you can. Just don't play games. Just be honest with God. Say, Lord, I see that on the screen, but I've never experienced that. I want to, Lord. Give me that peace. He will give it to you. He will give it to you. Just ask him. While today is the day of what? Salvation. Call on him. Call on him now. This also means peace is a person. Rest is a person. Come unto me. I, I know I'm getting way ahead, but rest is a person. Ultimate final rest is not about a day. Ultimate and final rest is not about a plot of land. It's about a person, Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath. Does that make sense? And he also calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath in Scripture, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. All right, go to Revelation 4. I want you to see this. What do I want you to see? Chairs. Go to Revelation chapter 4. What do I want you to see? Chairs, or better yet, thrones. Revelation chapter 4, please. I want you to see this. We're all turning to Revelation chapter 4. And since we're considering the concept of rest, we have to because it's mentioned nine times in our text. Nine times in 11 verses. I think God's trying to tell us something. <laughs> right? All right, you guys in Revelation chapter 4, we're back to the throne room again. And, and John says in verse 1, Revelation 4, 1, he says, And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. God's voice is powerful, isn't it? Which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit. That's how you ought to come to church. That's how we ought to come to church, in the Spirit. And behold, a throne. A what? A throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. When you see the throne, I want you to write down two words. Authority, right, because the person's ruling, and rest. Now, no, let's do it this way, two R's. It'll be easy to remember. Rule, rest. When you see a throne in heaven, that's teaching us rule. Someone's ruling. Someone's ruling. And someone's resting. Okay. So let's keep going here. And then he says here, and, um, and behold, a throne was <clears throat> set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, right? One sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. This would denote his glorious heavenly uh, appearance. Also, the emerald is green. Green symbolizes life. This is the God of life, the true and the living God. Verse 4, <clears throat> and round about the throne were four and twenty what? See, see how these seats keep showing up? These seats keep showing up? Seats represent, as we just said, seats and thrones here in heaven represent two R's. What are the R's again? Rule. And what? Rest. Right. When we talk about Jesus being resurrected and doing what at God's right hand? Sitting. Why do we say that? Because he's ruling. And because he's what? Resting. He's ruling because all power in heaven and earth has been given to him. And he's resting. Why? Because he's already completed the work of redemption. Y'all get it? You get it? Right. Right. But you and I take place. Uh, we take part in this as well. Because verse 4, he says, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Twenty-four seats, right? And upon the seats, I saw 24 elders sitting. Who are the 24 elders? You. 
All true believers. The 24 elders represent the Old Testament church, 12 tribes. New Testament church symbolized by 12 apostles. 12 plus 12 is 24. This is all the church, all the saints redeemed by the blood of Christ from the beginning of time until the end of time. John is able to see the end game that all of God's elect are seated at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning with Christ. That's exactly what it's saying. That's exactly what it's saying. And then it says here, and 24 elders sitting clothed in what? What are they clothed in? White raiment. Why is it white? Purity. Purity. Righteousness. Innocence. Triumph. This is the righteousness of Christ given to all the saints. Now you see how it's us? Right. Aren't we clothed in the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness, which is Christ's righteousness, not your own? Right? There you go. And then it says here, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head what? Crowns of gold. We had the crowns of gold on for like five minutes. Then we take them off and throw them down at Jesus' feet. Isn't that right? Because he's the one that worked for those crowns, and he's the one that gets all the glory. But it symbolizes the thrones and crowns. Thrones and crowns symbolize Christians ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ because we're one with him. Now, I can go on and on, but go to chapter 20. Let me show you one more, and we've got to keep moving. Chapter 20. But, but our focus primarily is rest. If we're sitting down, we're rest. That means the work is done. We're resting. We've entered into our everlasting rest. Giving you a hint. That's the, listen, that's the ultimate rest that Hebrews 4 is talking about. The eternal, everlasting, heavenly rest that's laid out for us. That rest sounds better and better the older you get. Doesn't it? The older you get, that rest starts sounding pretty good, doesn't it? It starts sounding pretty good. Look at Revelation chapter 20. I want you to see a verse. Uh, mm. Let me see here for time. Uh, verse one. <clears throat> and I saw an angel come down from heaven. The angel here. It, this is symbolism. Symbology. The angel here really is a picture of the angel of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ coming down. When he came down in his incarnation. And it refers to his perfect sinless life. And then. Um, it goes on talking about him bounding the devil. That's his cross work at the cross. When he died, Satan was bound and cast down out of heaven. Okay. So it says he came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. The chain is not literal. The key is not literal. All these things symbolize chains are a, a symbol of bondage. Keys represent what? Two A's authority, access, authority, access. Verse 2, he, Christ laid hold on the dragon. We know that's the devil, right? Yeah, that old serpent, which is the what? The devil and Satan and what bound him a thousand years. A thousand years is not literal. It's figurative. It's 10 times 10 times 10. It refers to an entire, complete, innumerable a, a time period. It refers to the whole time period between Jesus' first coming and second coming. That's what the thousand years is. Okay. And then he goes on to say uh, here, <clears throat> verse 3, and he cast him into the bottomless pit. In, that's the abyss. That's into the abyss. And he shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. That's why you believe the gospel, because Satan was bound. That's the only reason you and I believe the gospel, because he was bound. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. There will come a time period where he will be loosed temporarily just before Christ comes back. Now, verse four is what I want you to see. And I saw what? There they go again, which symbolize two R's. What are they? Rest and rule. Watch this. I saw thrones and they sat upon them. The day is the believers, the 24 elders we just saw earlier. And judgment was given unto him. Y you and I shall judge angels. Did y'all know that? That's first Corinthians chapter six. You and I shall judge angels. We shall, the saints shall judge the world. First Corinthians chapter six, verse one and two. Just write it down. You can look at it later. I saw thrones and they, and they uh, sat upon them. See the sitting? What does that denote? Rest and rule. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast. That would be this ungodly uh, political world system. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Right? Because we don't take the seal of the beast because we have the seal of the spirit. Right? 
Yeah. And then it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then it goes on. We've gone through this whole chapter before in Bible study, but I want you to see the rule and the rest there. That's the rest. Go back to Hebrews 4. That's the rest that Paul is talking about. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. That's what he's talking about. The heavenly, eternal, everlasting rest that's laid up for, her, for us when we finish, cross the finish line. Isaiah, in Isaiah eleven ten 10, called it a glorious rest. A glorious rest. And this is what you and I are looking for. Nothing in this world, achievements, possessions, accolades, accomplishments, attainments, none of those things can give rest to your soul like Christ can. None of those things can. They will leave you empty. You and I, according to Solomon in Ecclesiastes 3, have an eternity-sized hole in our heart, and only Christ can fill it. Isn't that right? There's way more to say about that, but yeah, time is something else. Let's go to point number three. Point number three, okay? I want you to focus in on the word promise. That's a very important word for you and me. Promise. I want you to see it in our text. Verse two. Verse two. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Unto us, that would be the Jewish Christians Paul's writing to and us here at Way of Grace. As well as unto them. That's talking about the Old Testament Jews that perish. Okay. He's saying they both heard the gospel. They heard it. We heard it. But the word preached did not profit them. How come? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Everybody see that there? The one word I want you to uh, see here in verse 2 is the gospel. For unto us was the what? For, verse 2. For unto us was the what? Gospel. Now go back to verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest they what? Promise. Verse 1 promise. Verse two, gospel. Verse one, promise. Verse two refers to that same promise under the phrase gospel. So we're going to learn right now. Okay. The term promise is a synonym for the gospel. I want you to add that to your biblical vocabulary. The term promise is a synonym for the gospel. So on your outline, you have the promise equals blank line, blank line, right? So you want to write on those lines there, the gospel. You don't want to leave with a blank uh, quiz sheet, right? So you want to write that there. The promise there equals the gospel. In fact, let me, let, let's do it this real quick grammatically. Did you know the word promise and the word gospel have the same uh, Greek word in them? Agalos. Promise and gospel have the same root in them, angelos, angelos, right? So even grammatically, they are uh, et 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 etymologically um, similar, very similar. So let's talk about how the gospel is a promise. How is the gospel a promise? Well, first of all, uh, Paul in verse one uses the word promise, and then he's referring to the same thing, but then he calls it the gospel in verse two, okay? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Okay. So letter A, 3A on your outline. The promise is a synonym for the what? I hope you leave with that today. The gospel or the promise is a synonym for the gospel. You, those words can be used interchangeably at times. Okay. Why is the gospel a promise? And how is the promise or how can it be considered the gospel. This is what I want you and I to consider at this time. If you will, please go to Galatians 3. I want to show you in your Bible. When we talk about the gospel, we're talking about a promise. We really are. Because when you talk about the gospel, you're talking about a covenant. You guys would agree with that, right? Yeah, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And he will show them his covenant. The word covenant there is a synonym for the gospel. Is not a covenant a solemn promise between two people? Of course. Of course. Now you guys are turning to Galatians 3. Can I get 2 Peter 1, 3? On 2 Peter 1, verse 3 on the overhead. While he's putting that verse up, look at Galatians 3, 8. <clears throat> Galatians chapter... Three, are you guys there? Look at verse um, eight. This is Paul writing to the uh, Galatian church. And he says here, uh, verse six, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, 
Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So being a child of Abraham doesn't have anything to do with your bloodline or pedigree. It has to do with faith. Being a biological Jew does not make you Abraham's descendant. Faith in Jesus makes you Abraham's descendant. Okay, this is what he's saying. So if you're a believer in Jesus, you're a true Jew, no matter what color your skin is. Okay, verse 8. <clears throat> and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. He would justify the Gentiles through faith. Preached before the what? Gospel. Unto who? Abraham. How so? Saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Y'all know that verse? That's Genesis 12, 3, right? Paul says, that's the gospel. I know we've talked about that before. Genesis 12, 3, when God said to Abraham, I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Paul says, hey, that was the gospel. That was the gospel. Because it prophesied the coming of the seed the Lord Jesus, who was in Abraham, who would come into the world and by his death at the cross, he would justify believing heathen Jews and Gentiles all over the world. OK, so ready? Verse eight calls it the what? The gospel that was preached to Abraham. Right now, go to verse 16 and watch what word is used. Verse 16. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed. Well, the what? There you go. See it? That's good, isn't it? Where the promise is made. That means the gospel, verse 8, that God preached to Abraham was a promise. It was a promise. It, it was the covenant of grace that contained exceeding great and precious promises. Does not the gospel contain exceeding great and precious promises? Right? Think about it right now in your head. When you think about the gospel, think about promises that are made in the gospel. Here's a promise. I promise never to leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that a promise? Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. I'm with you always, right? Right, right. Here's a promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Here's a promise. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a promise. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I can go on and on. Those are promises that are contained in the gospel. Notice this. According to... As his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life, uh, a spiritual life and godliness, how we live out uh, uh, the gospel in this world through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He's called us to a life of glory and virtue. Now, verse four is what I want you to see, please. Verse four. Watch this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious. What? There you go. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the gospel. Right. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. It does not mean that you and I are gods. It does not mean that you and I are little gods. Big time heresy that's been uh, uh, perpetrated today. Right. You and I are little gods. Hey, what it's saying. But what it's saying is the uh, 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 the seed and the likeness of the nature of God is implanted in us by the seed of the gospel. When the gospel is preached and it comes in faith. That's what it's saying. Don't we bear the likeness of the nature of Christ in us? That's what it's talking about. The fruit of the spirit. That's what it's talking about. OK, having escaped the corruption of the of this world through what lust It's Jesus that delivers us from a lifetime, a lifetime of bondage to carnal lust and sin. Isn't that right? Isn't that why we love him? Because he first loved us and delivered us. Right. But I wanted you to see the promises there. Now, one other thing I need you to see. We're going to go to the next letter. Second Corinthians one twenty. One more thing about promises. You can look up these other verses later. One more thing about the promises. The, the reason why we have the gospel, listen, is because Jesus kept all of the promises that were required of him in that covenant. Christ came, listen, Christ came and fulfilled all the conditions of the covenant of works by his obedience and by the shedding of his blood. He ratified the other covenant, which is the covenant of grace. And Jesus fulfilling the covenant of works, bringing into reality the covenant of grace is all a part of the everlasting covenant. That's three covenants. Y'all need to get that. That's three covenants. You guys need to get that or you won't understand the gospel right. Jesus came and kept all the conditions of the covenant of work. This is covenant theology. Understanding the gospel right is understanding covenant. I'm going to say it again. Number one, Jesus came and, and fulfilled, kept all the conditions of the covenant of works under the law. Born of a woman, made of a woman, made under the law, right? 
He kept it all. And because of his perfect perpetual obedience to the law, by his active and passive obedience, that means his life of obedience and him submitting his body to the crucifixion and, and, and atone for our sins by the shedding of his blood. He said, this is the new covenant in my what? Blood, which is shed for many. When the blood was shed, the old covenant was put away. The new covenant was ratified. The covenant of what? Grace. Right. Covenant of works. He fulfilled it, established the covenant of grace. And all of that, it was played out in linear fashion because in eternity past, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit came up with the what? Everlasting covenant. Everybody get that? All of this is a part of the everlasting covenant. So three overall covenants, they all come together as one big overarching covenant. And all that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ, okay? Because all the promises Jesus said to his father in every condition, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And he came and kept them all, right? So that's why 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, for all the what? Promises of God. All the promises of God in him, in Christ, are yea and amen. Not yes and no. Yes, yes. Amen. Affirm, affirm, affirm. He agreed to it and, and kept all of them. Kept all the conditions of the covenant. That's the only reason why we're saved. In Christ are yes and amen unto the what? Glory of God. And then what? By us. There's an application for you and I. They're, 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 they're ultimately realized because they're kept by God in Christ. But then ultimately, listen, listen, listen. The application of them to sinners is through you and I preaching the gospel by which men and women get saved. And they get brought into this wonderful Covenant of grace. Does that make sense? So you and I play a part in this. Not that God had to had to use us, but he's pleased to use us. That's what he says. Five chapters. Um, yeah, five chapters after this in Second Corinthians, chapter six, that we're co-laborers together with God. It's really awesome. That's why we preach the gospel, because we believe that God is fulfilling his covenant purposes to save his people. But he's only saving his people through his people. That makes sense. He's saving his people. How? Through his people, through human means, through you and I sharing the good news of the gospel with other people that they might be saved. OK, letter B. So I'm hoping that it makes a little bit more sense why the gospel is really a promise. Letter B. The, here's the other reason why the gospel and the promise are synonyms, because when you think about the gospel, listen, you're thinking about a unilateral reality, a unilateral reality. Go with me to Genesis uh, 15, please. <clears throat> we don't have too much more time left. We'll see what we can do. When you think about the gospel, I want you to think about the gospel with two words. Number one, unilateral, unilateral. That means one person is keeping all the conditions. One person is doing all the work. Everybody get that there? Bilateral means there's two parties. You keep your conditions and you keep your conditions and both sides have to keep their conditions of the covenant. And then that thing gets done. Unilateral it's one side doing it all. It's God doing it all because salvation is by what grace. So if you think about the gospel rightly, you're, you're understanding that it's all by grace and therefore it's unilateral. So as you go to Genesis 15, you see this language running through the Bible. When you see this language in the Bible, you know you're hearing gospel. OK, listen. When you go through the Bible, even in the Old Testament, when you hear God say, I will this, I will that, I will this, I will that, right? I will take out your stony heart and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will uh, sprinkle you with clean water and I will put my spirit in you and I will redeem you and I will on and on, right? That's gospel language. It's marriage language. I will, right? I will. Is it being a Christian being married to Christ? Mm -hmm. All right, I want you to see this unilateral reality. Uh, Genesis 15, I hope you guys are there. Genesis 15, God made this promise to Abraham that it, back in uh, verse 5, that his seed would be like the stars in heaven. That's a promise. Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's verse 6. But then Abraham's like, okay, but how am I going to know? Right? How do I know that these things will happen? Okay, He just wanted more information to inform his faith. So God graciously did something for Abraham. This is a uh, Old Testament sort of uh, Middle Eastern uh, sort of uh, nomadic covenantal process that two parties would engage in when they engaged in a solemn covenant. OK, that's what you're going to see here. Genesis uh, 15. God says, OK, I, I got something for you, Abraham. Let me give you a visual. Verse eight. He said, Abraham said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Watch what God says to Abraham. And he said to him, take me a heifer of how old? 
And a she goat of how old? And a ram of how old? Why three years? Because it refers to Jesus' three year ministry. It refers to three, Jesus' three year ministry. Wasn't his ministry three years? All these animals were killed after three years. Christ was crucified at the end of his three year ministry. So God has given Abraham a visual picture of the crucified Christ even before it comes. Thusly, Jesus can say, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it by faith and was glad. So, so take me a heifer. That's a calf. And a, a, a she-goat. And the she-goat in the Old Testament was a sin sacrifice. And a ram. A ram is a lamb. A male lamb. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Y'all see Jesus here? And a turtle dove. Remember, the Spirit of God came down on Jesus like a dove, right? And a young pigeon. Pigeon was a sacrifice for poor people in the Old Testament, according to Leviticus chapter 5. Jesus is a, is a sacrifice for spiritually poor sinners like us. Christ is all over the text. I could sit right here and preach Christ for the rest of the day. Okay, verse 10. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst. That means he cut up the animals. That means there was blood everywhere. That means covenants were only ratified by blood. Abraham was only justified by blood. You and I are only accepted with God by what? Somebody has to die in order for you and I to be accepted. That's Christ, right? Okay, he divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abraham drove them away. That's what you're to be doing when the word's being preached. The fowls here, remember the parable of the seed and the sower? The fowls of the air represent the devil coming, listen, listen, coming down to steal the seed of the word out of your heart while it's being preached. So right now you have all kinds of fowls you got to get out of your head. Because right now while I'm preaching, some of you are thinking, man, what am I going to do after church? Where are we going to go eat? What am I going to do tomorrow? Man, I got to get up early on Monday. I got to go to work. Come on, them kids. I got to deal with them hard-headed kids. All these thoughts are going through your head. Tell me I'm lying. You got to fight against those during the preaching. Right, because the fowls of the air want to come and distract you, make you think about something else. We only got like an hour and 10 minutes and we're done. He don't want you to hear the gospel so you can grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. You got to fight against that. Abraham knew, get these fowls out of here. I need to hear what my God is saying to me. I need to hear it. All right. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. He's our example. That's why he's Father Abraham. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. I love that. And a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Why is God putting Abraham to sleep? It's a foreshadow of the one who had to be put to sleep in order for you and I to be saved, Jesus Christ. Sleep is a euphemism for death, right? The other thing I want you to see here is, listen, this is so important. Abraham had to be put to sleep because the covenant was not about Abraham. The covenant ultimately is not between God and Abraham. It's between God and God. It's not about Abraham. Abraham thought the covenant was about him. And in those days, when you made that old Middle Eastern covenant, you sliced the animals up, blood all over the place, half the animals here, half the animals there. The two parties entering into the covenant will walk through the pieces together. So Abraham's like, I, I know how this works. I'm getting ready to walk through with God. God says, no, you're not. You're going to sleep. You're not walking through. The two parties that are going to keep the conditions of the covenant is not God and man. It's God and God. Did y'all get it? That's the gospel. Write it down. The gospel is a monergistic work. The gospel is a monergistic work. Y'all had time to write that down just now. I'll say it again. The gospel is a monergistic work. Mono means one. Erg means work. One person doing all the work. He by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Is that Hebrews 1, 3? Jesus did it. It wasn't us and Jesus. It was Jesus, right? In fact, all three persons of the Trinity were working. Okay, so Abraham is asleep. <laughs> Verse 13, and he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not there. So he's talking about the Jews that would go into Egypt for 400 years and shall serve them and they shall afflict them. How long? 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. God tore up Pharaoh in Egypt, didn't he? And afterward, they shall come out with a great substance. Verse 15, and you shall uh, go to your fathers in peace. There's that peace again. 
and you can be buried in a good old age. Abraham lived how long? 175 years. Verse 16. See, God always keeps his promise. We can trust him. Men lie. God never lies. OK, verse 16. Watch this. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The, the Amorites was the strongest of the tribes of the Canaanites. So the term Amorites refers to all those tribes that were in the land of Canaan. God says, I'm going to punish them, but I'm giving them 400 years to repent first. So when you listen to people that talk about God was unkind and he was uh, uh, unjust to go in and tear them people up and take them out of their land. God gave them people 400 years to repent and they would not repent. God was just to do what he did. He was just to do what he did. And they were killing babies and offering him in the fire. That's why our nation is in so much trouble, because we're engaging in Moloch worship, too. And I'm wondering why God is being so patient to the United States. It blows my mind that we're still here and we're still the freest country in the world. God has been so good to us. He's giving us time to repent until our cup is full, too. United States turn before it's too late. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Verse 17. And it came to pass that when the watch this, when the sun was set and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace. And a burning lamp that passed between the pieces. The covenant was between the smoking furnace and the burning lamp. The smoking furnace is Christ. The burning lamp is the father. The smoking furnace that is smoke coming from fire, which represents the fire in a tempered way. Christ is God's tempered presence toward us. The wrath, the fiery, white, hot wrath of God is tempered by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. God is a consuming fire, but that wrath that would have consumed us was consumed in the person of Christ. Does that make sense? And in the burning lamp, God is a consuming fire and God is light. So these two persons, uh, these two symbols going through the pieces are the two people that entered into the covenant. God, the father and God, the son. And Abraham is brought into the covenant that was already made in eternity past between the father and the son. That's how we understand the gospel. Right. Did everybody get that there? See how it's unilateral, unilateral between God and God. That's some good news of the gospel, because if any of that was left on us, we would mess it up in five seconds, would we? We mess that thing up in five seconds. God, don't put it in my hands. Please don't put it in my hands. Let her see. Stay where you are. Let her see real quick. The gospel was preached in both the Old and the New Testament. This is what I want to do. Can we get our home text back up? Our home text is uh, verse 2, Hebrews 4, 2. Just stay right here for time's sake. I want to put that back up. Paul made a, a monumental statement. Okay, hang in a few more minutes. Look what it says here. Paul says, for unto us was the gospel preach. Okay, we, I can see that pretty, we can see that pretty easy. As well as unto them. Huh? The gospel was preached unto us. Okay, got that. As well as unto them. Huh? Paul is saying that the Old Testament Jews had the gospel preached to them. They had a gospel preached even before the New Testament was written. The gospel, therefore, is contained in the Old Testament scriptures. All the scriptures are about the person and work of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and him crucified. All of them are. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. They heard what they heard amounted to the gospel and they rejected <clears throat> that gospel. How did these Old Testament saints hear the gospel? That's our question. How did the Old Testament saints hear the gospel? Can you put up um, Exodus 6.6? 6, 6? Exodus 6, 6. Show you two verses on the overhead. And uh, we'll see what we're going to do at that point. Look at this verse up here. Exodus 6, 6. <clears throat> this is what God <clears throat> says to Moses when he came to him on the backside of that burning, uh, uh, the, the mountain in the burning bush. He says, wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, Moses, this is what I want you to say to them. I am the Lord and I will bring you out. <laughs> I will see that I will. I will bring you out. Is that deliverance? Is that redemption? They only came out after the what was shed and put on the doorpost. 
The blood of the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus. Did they have the gospel in emblem and type and figure and shadow? They did. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. When he saves us, doesn't he bring us out of a burden and captivity to sin? Yes. And I will rid you out of their bondage. We didn't deliver ourselves. He did it. And as I will again, I will rid you of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. That's the judgment of God's wrath on Christ at Calvary. See the gospel there? They had the gospel. Look at the next verse. I could just go right there. I will take you. Um, I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. One more verse. And then I will bring you into the land. He brought them into the promised land. God finally brings us into glory. I will bring you into the land concerning which I did swear. Is that a promise or what? Yeah, and I did swear to give it to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. See the I wills there? That's gospel. I was going to show you another one, but I'm not. I was going to show you another one that goes with this, but I think you can see it here. It's the gospel. Numbers 21, verse 4, real quick. Numbers 21, verse 4. The first time the gospel was preached in the Bible was Old Testament. In fact, the first time God preached the gospel, he preached it to the devil. Did you guys know that? Did y'all know that? The first time gospel, God preached the gospel was Genesis 3.15 when he preached it to the devil. We call it the proto-evangelium. The proto-evangelium. The proto-evangelium is the first proclamation of the gospel anywhere in Holy Writ. And it's Genesis 3.15. Yep, God preaching way back in the Old Testament from the beginning. Yep, all through the Bible. Now, you guys are looking at Numbers 21, 4, right? Here's an example. Israel murmuring and complaining, so God sent venomous snakes and tore them up. <laughs> you guys remember that? Everybody getting bit and dying. And verse 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged. By the way, verse 5, <clears throat> he says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. We loathe Christ. Christ is the bread that comes down from heaven, right? Christ is the manna. We're tired of the gospel. We're tired of Christ. Next verse. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. God kills and God makes alive, right? All right. God sent the snakes in. Now look at verse 7. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. Now they want to confess they sinned. They got some venom in their system. Now they want to confess. <laughs> we've sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Moses there represents Christ who intercedes between us in the wrath of God. Now look at the next verse. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses. Now, by the way, this is Numbers 21. But remember, God made the promise they wouldn't enter into the land in Numbers 14. This is uh, 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 seven chapters later. This is the same people. They're, now they're going to uh, get here in recorded in Scripture, the gospel. The Lord sent unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. The last thing that you would want to see after you got bit by a serpent is another serpent. <laughs> right? Who wants to look at another snake? But God's ways are not our ways. Right. And the serpent that was put up on the pole represents the crucified Christ who was hung up on the pool of Calvary's, the pole of Calvary's tree. And they had to look up at a serpent because it represented Jesus who came in the form, in human form, in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, yet without sin. Romans chapter 8, right around verse 3. When Christ came, he looked just like another serpent bit sinner, but he really had no sin. And he was hung up on Calvary's tree, bearing our sin, and bearing the curse for our sins. And it's by looking to him in faith, that we're saved from the venom bite of sin. Doesn't that make sense? Oh, death, where is your sting? Right, it's been removed by the death of Jesus. And it's put on a pole. Why a pole? 
The pole there, that term pole in Hebrew means ensign. Ensign. Or, ready? Banner. Banner. If you're going to be saved from your sin, you've got to look to the banner, which is Christ. The banner is the meeting place for God's army. Once you become a, a, a part of the people of God, you become God's army. Christ is our gathering place. Christ is our meeting place. If I be lifted up, I will what? Draw all men unto me. And as the banner is an ensign or symbol for warriors who are in the midst of war, the other application we can make to ourselves is in the, in the time of conflict and battle and war, because before salvation, you and I are at war with God. We're at war with God. But God says, if you can get to my banner, the warfare will be over. My wrath and uh, uh, instruments of vengeance and punishment will be turned away from you and turned on my son who will take the punishment in your place. If you get to the banner, which is Christ, does that make sense? Christ is our gathering place. Flee to Christ and you will escape the wrath of God. They saw the gospel. They saw Christ hanging up on Calvary's tree in the Old Testament. And the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. You should see the cross there and it shall come to pass. That everyone that is bitten when he does good works shall be saved. Right? I'm making sure you don't nod your head. All right? It doesn't say that. All right? When he looks upon it, shall live. The command is to look to Christ, not to do something. To look. To look to the crucified Christ, who, when he died on Calvary's tree, said, It is finished! Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Isn't that the promise? That's the promise. So they did have the gospel. They did have the gospel. I'm going to end it here. I know you guys are tired. I'm going to end it here. What we're going to do is if you can mark your outline where we are, we're going to stop here because we have to take the Lord's table. I'm looking forward to developing in our text the three rests that are there from verse 3 all the way to verse 9. You do have it kind of spelled out on your outline, but we, I'm looking forward to dealing with that and the significance of what it means for the word to be mixed with faith. I can't wait to talk about that. These are very important, relevant truths, relevant truths for us that I pray that God will help us to understand. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Stop here. All right. We will uh, get ready to take the table if we can get the bread. <clears throat>